So, last year, if you will recall, we had uh, around 90 days to the, the, the Department of Justice, rather, had the 90 days to prepare the first uh, in justice summit that was held at uh, the Manila Hotel. And uh, that was history, and now we are again making history because for just two weeks, we tried to gather everyone from the private sector, from the government sector, of course, our media partners as well, for this uh, forum on the Cybercrime Prevention Act. And the person who spearheaded all of this, uh, of course, is no less than our head of the Office of the Cybercrime. Please help me welcome Assistant Secretary Jeronimo L.C. Please come in. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It's, a, it's going to be a 36-slide deck of presentation and uh, you can help me with the slides because we've cut it up the slides into three uh, portions of 12 decks each one is on IT for IT people the next set of 12 is for law for legal people and the third deck is on uh, policy for policymakers but the real challenge is that we've mixed all the 12 slides together into a stack of 36 hopefully we can address some of your questions so for the next session, about 30 to 40 minutes, I'd like to be, keep it very short and crisp. One is uh, I'd like to give you a short overview. Second, instead of doing the sections uh, of the law section by section, we just go straight to the heart of the matter. Section 4, section 5, 6, 7, 12, 19, 20. Hopefully that will cover up all the questions you've raised. Of course, you are free to comment um, now or, or after. And then towards the last part of the 10-15 minute uh, time allotted, we will talk about some of the challenges in implementation. After all, we are all concerned about how our law is supposed to be implemented. Okay? Ready? Good. So this is now the, the, the title of the presentation. Um, this is a long tagline, but this is now the Office of Cybercrime, which was constituted just on October 3. And uh, I was formally appointed also on that date, the new Office of Cybercrime. Hopefully, this will bring our crime fighting tools, crime prevention, to the 21st century. And uh, the whole point is to go against transnational organized crime, criminal syndicates. As a matter of priority, let me say it on my lawyer's oath, blogging, individual comments, tweeting, um, boyfriend-girlfriend discussion, those are not the priorities of the Department of Government. It's very difficult as it is to catch fugitives from justice, what more individual tweets and individual likes. So let's manage our expectations, let the law work, see how we can uh, manage the, the new law to the implementing rules and regulations. I have a very special announcement towards the end of the presentation. Okay? And uh, thank you, Dondi, for the quick presentation. At least that gives me a head start. This is now the internet world. I don't want to belabor the point, so I'll go on to the next slide. And I just want to summarize earlier what we talked about. It's the sub emergence of cybercrime is beyond question. The substantial difference between physical and virtual worlds. And of course, the reach, accessibility, and the convenience of doing it. And the question becomes, are you more likely than not to do or say something wrong or bad if you're online, whether you're in physical world? That is the first question we have to ask ourselves individually. More likely or not? If it's the same, then there's no substantial difference. But you and I know that if you're sitting behind a computer, online, fast internet connection, there are different dynamics that come into play. And first is the sense of permanence. Let me go back to this concept of permanence in a bit. And then the need for law regulation, which I don't think is anything that needs to be uh, argued or discussed. So in 07, the Department of Justice um, conducted our first international uh, cybercrime conference. Some of you were there. And we had such a difficult time passing um, a set of ICT laws, including the DICT and all that. So we strategized and said, why don't we come up with a three-pronged approach? And the three-pronged approach now is what you see the Data Privacy Act, 10173. Of course, there are certain issues there. Now, cybercrime, 10175, and then cybersecurity. 
And so this one seems to, uh, seems to validate the strategy taken in 06, 07, that instead of lumping all the laws together and for legislators, everyone, to have difficulty grappling with privacy issues, cybercrime, internet, why don't we just manage the process and cut it up into three portions? So our simple advice is when you're reading one particular part, read it in conjunction with the whole thing. We said, let's declare private first. Let's declare sanctity, sanctuary for certain information. Then we'll talk about criminal behavior. Then talk about cybersecurity. Okay? At least we have two out of three. And uh, regardless of uh, what happened, we will not talk about the assertions. I mean, who is responsible for what? It's a whole government responsible. It's a whole society responsible. But personally, I would like to thank um, Congressman Tinga, who has been the number one supporter of the DOJ and the Technical Working Group. And uh, as I always say, it must already done. So this is how where we are now. Oh, sorry. Okay, from the time that we had the uh, I Love You virus, we already set up our cyber forensics laboratory. And the basic idea of cyber forensics laboratory is that if you have DNA example, blood samples, semen samples for rape, you would also need cyber forensics. Let's be channeled, how would you analyze certain log data? How would you go about introducing evidence in this regard? And we're very happy that we have basic uh, forensic capability today. Of course, this is a going, ongoing effort which we will continue to upgrade. And then, we also had our first conviction courtesy of the PNPCIDG team. This was under Section 33 of the old of the, of the e-commerce act. The context of the revised penal code in 1932, which is the general penal code that we have. 1960s, we started this process of quote-unquote special penal laws, the criminalization of certain acts, which is not covered by that. So you put that together, it now becomes this portion here, and that was the trend all the way to 2000 before we started legislating on IT. on libel. You read that with special penal laws, the e-commerce act, the rules on electronic evidence of the Supreme Court in 2001, that already gives you the framework penalty for online libel, which is an existing crime, which we have already seen about 80 to 85 percent of our dockets in our cyber forensic laboratory already deals with online libel. We don't want that to be the priority because it's catching up a lot of our resources, but we just want to say since 2000, we already have libel in our statute books. What happened? Fast forward, this is now the framework, 2012. We found out that even if we add these two, there was a whole range of emerging technology, new social media, new forms that have been described, new forms you're familiar with, that has not been legislated upon, and this is now the third block. Question, if you add these three blocks, does it cover the whole range of criminal behavior? Probably not. There will always be new forms, new challenges. As long as human society is involved, we will always have different aspects to it. But at least, that gives us a fighting chance. You have to remember, as we go to the uh, provisions later on. So welcome to 10175, the most controversial bill to date, and uh, the most healthy as we pass the law this year, for, especially if we the law for the first time. Okay, 10175, it's uh, wired, so you can download the site or whatever it needs to take. Let me now go to the first section, libel. And uh, this is now the default provision of 355. A government official would present to you this slide. It will be actually be scandalous of a baby saying these words. Putang inamo. This is something that we never hear of in a public forum. It will be scandalous. In fact, something that's totally out of character. But will not be hypocritical. You see this all the time. And this is just the most benign form. A baby saying P.I. mo. We're not even blocking the P, blocking the I, putting asterisk. That's just how it is. But the question now is, if this was posted on your Facebook account, we have judicial rules for that. And this is not the forum to discuss whether what's libelous or not. That's not the whole point. But the question that we're saying is that, with or without this, we are, we are very sure that we are entitled to our online reputation. Correct? We already have all have a sense that I have a right to my reputation, a good reputation. You also have a right. And this is where it gets tricky for media because now you're reporting it now you're, you're uh, saying this, but at the same time, you've also experienced it on your own. 
when you've been attacked personally, when your family has been attacked uh, individually, this is something that's a dual-edged dual sword. And whether or not it's decriminalized, there are, there's the flip side to it. Because if it's criminal behavior, the standard is proof beyond reasonable doubt, which is a high proof. Some people are saying we just go for civil liability or fine. That's fine. The proof will be lower, but easier to prove and probably more fines. So these are the debates that we need to have because remember, in 1932, when the revised penal code libel provision was done, nobody was alive. Or maybe one or two of you were born already. But we never had the chance to participate on discussing what is private to you, what is private to me. What is criminal behavior to you, what is criminal behavior to me. We never had this discussion in our history as a society, as a country. That is why, on a parallel effort the Department of Justice, since last year, we have been writing right the new criminal code of the 21st century. This one is something that can open the dialogue to say what is private, what is not, what is libelous, what is not, what is criminal, and what is not. So we can move forward. The small caveat that has also been raised is this portion. Other similar means which may be devised in the future. This raises the specter of, hey, what is the limit of libel? Wouldn't this put everyone into trouble? This provision. This is not nothing to fear. And aside from the three decks of slides, this is also going to be a short uh, language class, if you don't mind. In law, and this is for the lawyers, we have the use them generis rule. Correct? For all the lawyers there, or for legal speak. Use them generis is Latin. It says of the same kind. And this is now, this is not from a law book. This is just from Wikipedia. It says, if it's of the same nature, enumerated, whatever follows should be of the same kind. So far, so good. What does it mean? Through a computer system or any other similar means which may be devised in the future. This or part talks about computer system. So this one can only qualify that it has to have the nature characteristics of a computer system. Nothing beyond that, nothing out of bounds. So you have to appreciate that in the context of the use them generis rule, which any two-bit lawyer, any law student will tell you is something already existing. Okay?